We are now going to be looking at capital gains tax and trusts. Okay, so the first thing that you need to understand is that the same as with income, capital gains can also be taxed in the hands of a beneficiary or the trust or a donor in exactly the same way. When we looked at income, we saw that Section 25 capital B applies to beneficiaries and trusts. For capital gains tax purposes, the section that is, or the paragraph which is relevant is paragraph 80. And paragraph 81 and paragraph 82, as you can see over there, are the sections that discusses when the beneficiary and when the trust will be taxed. When we looked at income, we also saw that if there's a donation or a similar disposition, and section 7 applies, then the donor will be taxed. In that same way, that same principles to be studied there, is seen in paragraph 68 to 73. Um, and that is only for capital gains. So it really works in the same type of principle. If there's no donation, then the beneficiary or the trust must be taxed. Um, if the beneficiary receives an amount, if they have a vested right, they typically get taxed if there's no donor. So let's just ignore the donor for now. If there's a beneficiary of a vested amount, the beneficiary will be taxed on it. If the trustees decide to make a distribution to the beneficiaries, the beneficiary is taxed on it. And if it's a capital gain but it's retained in the trust, the trust is taxed on it. Um, this is, of course, all of these sections can be overridden if there is a donor in one of these paragraphs applies. So how does a capital gain arise? What causes there to be a capital gain? Now the first thing that you can think of, that you probably will think of, is um, that paragraph 2 of the 8th schedule tells us when we should consider capital gains. And it tells you it is when there's a disposal of an asset. Now typically if we think about that, that makes us think about things like selling an asset, donating an asset, those are all situations where there's a disposal of an asset. But you'll see that paragraph 80 actually discusses two situations. And the first one is when there is a vesting of an asset in a beneficiary, and the second is when the capital gain of an asset that's been disposed of vests in the beneficiary. So let's quickly just discuss the two concepts here. So the first one is where the trust vests an asset in the beneficiary. So as an illustration here, it says when a trust holds asset A, right, so the trust has an asset, and the trust then gives that actual asset to the beneficiary. So it moves from the hands of the trust to the beneficiary. So for example, the trust owns a block of flats, and then the trust gives or distributes that block of flats to the beneficiary. So instead of the trust owning it, the beneficiary now owns it. That is a disposal. Okay, that, that is called a vesting in a beneficiary. That is a disposal because it changes hands. Or it can be a situation here at the bottom, in paragraph 82, where the trust sells an asset, then it gets money from selling that asset, and it takes, takes that money that it made and gives that to a beneficiary. So the trust holds asset A, trust sells asset A, and the trust gives the money from the sale of the asset to the beneficiary. Those are the situations in which there's a capital gain. First one again, where the actual asset is transferred from the trust to someone else, the actual asset, and the second one is not where it's the actual asset, but where the asset is sold or disposed of, the trust gets money and gives that money or some of the money to the beneficiary. Now, just a couple of things I want you to be aware of over here, things that you need to look out for for paragraph 80. The first thing is it only applies to capital gains. So where proceeds is greater than a base cost. So if proceeds are 100 and base cost is 80, then we have a capital gain of 20. But if the proceeds were 80 and the base cost was 100 and we have a capital loss of 20, paragraph 80 would not apply. If there's a capital loss, 
the loss stays in the trust, so it's not transferred to a beneficiary. Paragraph 80 also only applies if the beneficiary is a resident. If the beneficiary is a non-resident, then it also stays in the trust. So if we make this capital gain of 20, and they say to you it goes to the beneficiary, but the beneficiary is a non-resident, that 20 will be taxed in the hands of the trust. Okay, so paragraph 81 is again the section that tells us this is where the trust takes an asset and then gives it to a beneficiary. That is called vesting an asset in a beneficiary. Now, the vesting of an asset in someone else's hands is a disposal. Paragraph 11 of the 8th schedule, and remember there's two disposal sections in paragraph or in the 8th schedule. Paragraph 11, which are the actual disposals, and paragraph 12, which is a deemed disposal. This is listed as one of the actual disposals. So it says when the trust vests an asset in a beneficiary, that is a disposal by the trust of that asset. Paragraph 111D tells us that. The time of that is at the date when the vesting takes place. Paragraph 13 tells us that. So this is where the trust, so the trust has an asset, and the trust then takes that asset and gives it to a beneficiary. How do we calculate capital gains? We calculate it as proceeds less base cost. What is the proceeds if the trust just gives away this asset to the beneficiary so it makes it vest? Well, a beneficiary is a connected person to a trust, so we'll apply paragraph 38 of the H schedule, which tells you that proceeds must be market value. Base cost will obviously be whatever the base cost is. Now, I want you to just be aware, this is something which we sometimes see people struggle with. Please understand that the date of vesting can be different than the date when the beneficiary receives the physical asset. So for example, on day one, Mr. X donates an asset to the trust and stipulates that the ownership vests in child B. The trust then actually transfers that asset to child B on day 600. Now, although the child then actually gets the physical asset on day 600, it already vested in the child on day one. So that is the date of vesting, day one. Okay, so just be aware of that. So for example, what we will sometimes see, just practically to think about it, is that we also have a trust over here. Right? Mr. X gives an asset to the trust. And he wants it to go to his child, which is a beneficiary. But this child is 14 years old. So Mr. X donates a house, let's say. To the trust and he says this house belongs to this child but the child is 14 years old so the child can't yet manage it but it vests in the child actually transfer this to the child when the child is 21 years old and can move into the house and look after themselves so it will vest on that date but it was actually just transferred on 21st so you don't have to physically own the asset or have it in your hands for it to have been vested the ownership can still vest in you even before it's transferred. As mentioned before also, please note that paragraph 81 only applies if the beneficiary is a resident. Okay, if they're non-resident, this capital gain is taxed in the hands of the trust. And again, just a comment that if there's a donation, then you have to consider paragraph 68, 69 and 71. If one of these sections applies, for example, 69 is when there's a minor child, a parent to a minor child, then the donor will be taxed. But we'll look at that in the more detail separately. So here's paragraph 81, some illustrations. So Mr. X passes away, and in terms of his will, a trust must be created. And asset A has to be transferred to the trust. Asset A had a market value of 1 million rands on the date of Mr. X's death. Child X is a beneficiary of the trust. Child X is 15 years old at the date of Mr. X's death. When child X turns 18, the asset has a market value of 1.3 million. This is a couple of basic scenarios. So scenario A, the, child, the asset vests in child X immediately. So let's just see the scenario. It says Mr. X stipulates that the asset vests in child X immediately but that the trust must transfer the asset to child X when child X turns 18. So child X is now 15, so they 
basically says three years from now, when the child is 18, then give them the physical asset, but it already vests in the child. So when the child X turns 18, the asset is transferred to child X. Now, you need to understand that there's no capital gain that is calculated on the date when the child X turns 18. Why? Because it already vested in the child when they were 15 years old. At that date, you would have calculated the capital gain, if any, in the hands of the trust, but there wouldn't be because it would be equal to the market value. Um, the proceeds would be the market value, which is a million, and the base cost would also be a million because that is what the base cost was in the hands of the trust when they received it. Because remember, when a person passes away and gives the asset to a trust or to any person, they are treated as if they sold it at market value, which is the base cost then. So there's null. Then we say over here, if child X then decides, when he's now 18, to sell it for 1.5 million rands, then there will be a capital gain of 1.5 million minus a million. A million is the base cost when child X received it, so on the date of Mr. X's death. So that 500,000 capital gain is then taxed in child X's hands. Okay, scenario B. The asset vests in child X later. So Mr. X stipulates the asset must vest in child X's hands when child X turns 18. The trust must then transfer the asset to child X. So see the difference here. Here, in scenario A, the asset vests immediately, but in scenario B, the asset only vests when child X turns 18. Okay, so child X is 15 at the date of death. When he turns 18, it must go to him. So when child X turns 18, the asset now vests in his hands. Now remember, that means that there's a disposal per paragraph 11 1D. So when there's a disposal of an asset, we have to calculate CGT. So we'll calculate the CGT as the difference between the proceeds, 1.3 million, and the base cost, 1 million rands, so 300,000 rands. That 300,000 rands must be taxed in child X's hands per paragraph 81. Okay, so understand the trust owned the asset or held the asset and then transfers it to child X. So usually the trust is the one that would have the capital gain. But paragraph 81 says, no, the beneficiary should be taxed on it. If child X then sells that asset for 1.5 million rands, there will be a capital gain of 200,000, which is the difference between the selling price of a million, one and a half million and the base cost for child X, which is the market value when it vested in his hands, which is 1.3 million. So see in child, scenario A, the base cost was a million rands because the asset vested immediately on the date of Mr. X's death. So can you see again, the date when it vests that is the date, or that determines what the base cost is if you sell it at a later date. Right, and then scenario C. The asset vests in child X later, and child X is a non-resident. So child X is not a resident of South Africa, and we have the same situation as scenario B. So again, that means the asset must vest when child X turns 18. So when child X turns 18, the vesting takes place, so there's a disposal. That capital gain of 300,000, which is the market value of the asset on the date he turns 18, versus the base cost when the trust received it, that 300,000 rands will now be taxed in the hands of the trust. Remember, the trust is the one disposing of it. And why? Because child X is a non-resident. And paragraph 81 specifically tells us that the child must be a resident. So again, Make sure you see the difference here. In scenario B, when the child is a resident, the child is taxed. In scenario C, the child is a non-resident, then the trust is taxed. If the child then sells that asset, because now it's the child's property, for one and a half million rands, that 300,000 capital, or 200,000 capital gain, which is again the difference between the selling price of one and a half and the 1.3 when it vested, that will be taxed in the hands of the child. 
again, we just have to now consider the child's in our residence, so it must be from an African source and so forth. Okay, let's look at paragraph 82. Now remember, 82 is a situation where the capital, the asset is disposed of, and then the money is given to the beneficiary. So Mr. X passes away, and in terms of his will, a trust must be created, and asset A has to be transferred to the trust. Asset A had a market value of a million rands on the date of his death. Child X is a beneficiary of the trust, and he's 15 years old at the time of Mr. X's death. When child X turns 18, the market value is 1.3. Okay, so same situation. So scenario A, the capital gain vests in child X. So Mr. X stipulates that the asset must be held in the trust until child X turns 18. The trustees must then sell the asset and distribute any money arising from the sale to child X. So see the difference here? Here the asset is sold and the money is given to child X. So it's not the actual asset. So the tr trustees sell it for 1.3 million rands. That's 300,000 rands gain, which is the difference between the 1.3 it was sold for and the million rands base cost when they received it. That will be taxed in the child X's hands per paragraph 82. Again, usually, if this was a normal taxpayer, the trust would be taxed because the trust is the one that held the asset and was the one disposing of it. But paragraph 82 puts it in the hands of the beneficiary. Scenario B, the trustees distribute the capital gain to child X. So what I want you to understand here, in scenario A, we saw, the child had a vested right to the capital gain from it. Right, because this says over here, it must go to the child. Now it says, Mr. X does not provide any instruction to the trustees on what to do when the asset is disposed of. Child X does not have a vested right. The trustees then decide to sell the asset when child X turns 18, and they use the discretion to distribute the proceeds to child X. So in scenario A, child X was entitled to it. In scenario B, Child X has no entitlement to it, but the trustees then decide to give it to them. I want you to understand that in both those situations, it's exactly the same. The child will still be taxed on it. So the same as when we saw when we looked at section 25B. If the trustees use the discretion to pay something to a beneficiary, that beneficiary is taxed. Then let's look at scenario C. Mr. X does not provide any instruction to the trustees on what to do in the case with the asset is disposal. Mr. X, uh, child X does not have a vested right. The trustees decide to sell it, and they decide to retain the proceeds in the trust. Right, so who does it belong to? Who gets it? No one. So who will be taxed on it then? The trust will be taxed on it, per paragraph 82. So again, the idea here is, if there is a beneficiary, the beneficiary will be taxed on it. If there is no beneficiary, the trust will be taxed on it. Now, in all of these situations we looked at here, there have been no donation. If there's a donation, again, the donor might be taxed on it if some of those sections apply. So, for example, if the child is a minor child, then the donor might be taxed on it. But we'll study that separately. So, this is the approach that we will follow. And you'll see this is similar to the income side of it. We'll ask. Was there a donation or a similar disposition, like a low interest loan? And is the donor alive? If we say yes, we'll consider paragraph 68 to 73. So instead of section 7, we consider paragraph 68 to 73. Does any of those sections apply? If yes, the capital gain is taxed in the hands of the donor. If we say was there a donation or a similar disposition and is the donor alive? No. Then we apply paragraph 80, which we just studied. Paragraph 80 says, does a beneficiary have a vested right? Or do the trustees distribute it to a beneficiary? Right, so that's, that's what it explains here. Does a continued right become a vested right? Remember, if the beneficiaries decide to give you an asset, it means it vests in you, or capital gain, it vests in you, then the beneficiary is taxed. If no, the trust is taxed. Same thing here, was there a donation or a similar disposition? And is the donor alive? Yes, let's say. Does paragraph 68 to 73 apply? No. Then we apply paragraph 80 again. So it works in exactly the same way that section 25b worked.